Dear friends in Christ, please join with me in prayer and let us go to our Lord and give thanks to him for all his blessings to us. Heavenly Father, I give thanks to you for blessing us this day with the opportunity to worship you and praise you, to lift up our voices and sing to you, to lift up our hearts in prayer to you. Lord, this day as we come before you, we ask that, uh, that we would be reminded of what it means to truly be successful in your eyes, what it means to have true success in your spirit, and what it means to walk as your people. May you always be our leader and our guide. This we pray through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Today our text for our sermon is actually going to be from 1 Corinthians and uh, chapter 1, and I encourage you to please turn to that in your service folder. But as we do look at that text, uh, I'm reminded of what Paul talks about as success and what we talk about success. And as I thought about this text, I, I know that I've mentioned to a number of you that while I was in high school, I had the opportunity to play football. I had an opportunity to play on the offensive line pretty often, all four years, and, uh, and to play for a team called the Warriors. Now, we weren't what you would call a winning team. In fact, as I say that, it's even a little painful now to remember that in four years, if my memory serves correctly, we won four times. And it was not once a year. In fact, we were everybody else's favorite homecoming team because we were the team that there was a sure thing. By my senior year, we did break that tradition for one team, but most of the time that was not the case. We weren't necessarily a bad team. We just weren't a good team. If it would have only been about the fourth quarter, we were the best condition, but alas, there are three other quarters, so we always got trounced. But I think some of you, I bring that up because I think some of you can relate to that. You've maybe played sports along the way. Uh, it doesn't have to be football. It could be uh, soccer or basketball. It could be baseball. And it's not very pleasant to lose, is it? It's not fun at all to lose. It's, in, in fact, unpleasant. Even You give your heart, you work your hardest, you try as best you can, and you lose. Has anybody ever experienced that before, had that same experience? It grows unpleasant, not, not just when you're out there on a field or on a court or in a match, but it's unpleasant in life. We don't like to lose. We like to be successful. We're people who like to win. In fact, even more than that, we like to be called the most valuable player. We like to be hefted up on the shoulders, maybe not literally, but to, uh, maybe, uh, maybe not literally, but we like to be hefted up as the hero, the one who everybody celebrates. And how do you then measure success? Is it by being called the hero? Is it by being the winner? Some of you, I imagine, and it's different for everyone, but some of you, I imagine, measure success by your family. Are my kids, as I raise them, are they growing up to be responsible citizens, responsible adults? Are my grandkids getting into jobs that are, that are well-paying and will be able to care for their families? Some of you, I imagine, measure success by your health. Have I managed to keep the pounds off, stayed on the right diet, listened to what my doctor told me? Some of you measure success by the degrees you have or the abilities that you have, how far along you got in schooling, how far along you got in the business that you worked. Some of you measure success, well, in life. You look around you and you notice that you do drive a little shinier car. Or your house is a little bigger than your neighbor's. There's all sorts of measures of success. And not just personal measures of success, but we measure success corporately as well and in our teams. Is our team successful? When we measure the success of our family, are my children getting good grades in school? Do they behave well? We measure success in our businesses. How successful have we done as a company this year? And when you think about that, we see a lot of worldly measures of success. A lot of ways in which the world measures what is done well. Who the winners are and who the losers are. Think about now if we put our spiritual lives in that same type of scale. Imagine for just a moment that, that statue of justice with her eyes blindfolded with a scale in her hand. If we strictly took the world's measurement for success in our spiritual lives and did the same thing, how would that scale look for you? On one side you have your sinfulness, on the other side you have those times when you have been faithful to God. I don't know about your scale, but mine would be a little off or a lot off. In fact, we all would actually fall into that category of losers, isn't that true? The unsuccessful. Which thank the Lord that then our measurement of success is by Christ balancing our scale. 
But there's more to it than just going right to the cross and stopping there. There's more to it than just saying, well, my spiritual life is successful because I know my sins are forgiven. In and of itself, that is all we need for salvation, absolutely. But as we look at our spiritual lives, there's so much more that God intends for us. There is so much more that God has planned for us. And I encourage you to go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And Paul, as he talks about success, and as he talks about success, he does so in the Lord. And he doesn't stop in chapter 1, but he goes on for 15 chapters after this, all the way through chapter 16, talking about the ways that the people in Corinth should live. But there's one theme that overarches the entire book, and that we even see right here. And that's unity. Unity. And that flies right in the face of the world's measure of success, honestly. Because as we look at the world's measure of success, it talks about who is number one. What have I done to be successful? In what ways am I conquering? When we look at God's word, it's not a question of I, but it's a question of we. We are the body of Christ. We are the community of believers. We are those who God has placed together as misfits as we may be. We might not be the best at our sports, the best at our marriages, the best at our families. We may not be the best Christians, but God places us together as the family of Christ. And we are unified by his Holy Spirit. And when we start to look at ourselves as the number one, as the most important it's easy to forget what success is. It's easy to forget who's most important. Instead of having a Christocentric, a Christ-centered heart, we, become, we have a self-centered heart. What is best for me? How do things affect me? What makes me happy? And we see this destructive everywhere. This is destructive in our families. This is destructive in a business. This is destructive in our churches. This is destructive in our world. Think about the ways when you have worked with people who it's all about them. Does that work in business? No. What about in your family? If it's all about you, is there happiness? Is there peace? No, there's discord and pain. What about in the church? The pain that comes from one person Two people thinking it's all about them, about what they want, about the way they think sh things should be. And it's just look around our world, and we see how much this self-centered attitude puts down those around us, puts down those in our lives, puts down those in need, and forgets that important truth that when one part of the body hurts, the entire body hurts. We are not just merely harming others when we put ourselves first, when we seek our own success, when we seek our own victory, but we are hurting others as well. We are hurting the rest of the body of Christ because of our own selfishness, because of our own desires. And you know those things in your life which are most important to you. You know those things which maybe you won't stop at nothing to gain, but you strive for quite a bit. Some of those things, they're important parts of our lives. But that they're not the only part of our lives. Most important to us is, should not be what is best for us, but what is best for God's people. What is get best for God's community of believers. What is best for our world to bring salvation. See, true success is not bound up in us but it is bound up in Christ our Savior. It is wrapped up in Him so much so that at the end of 1 Corinthians chapter 1, Paul said, let no one boast unless he boasts in the Lord. So much so is our success wrapped up in Christ that we need to confront these feelings of self-centeredness, this self-desire and self-fulfillment and instead look at that cross. And when we look at that cross, we see a man who humbled himself we see God who humbled himself, who took on human flesh, who gave his own life for our sins, who sacrificed his life so that we might have life. 
Only there do we see true success. Only on the cross do we see the success of the defeat of sin, death, and the devil. But as long as we allow these attitudes to live in our lives, we cannot see that for the joy that it is. As long as we allow these destructive attitudes to rule our hearts, we cannot look to the cross without first saying, how does that benefit me? That is not the question we should be asking. But we, when we look at the cross, we should be asking the question, how has Christ blessed humanity? All people. All people, not just those who make it to church every Sunday. Not just those who are regular in prayer. Not just those who sing the loudest of, with them and they sing the hymns. But all people. That is who Christ died for on the cross. Not just me, but everybody. And yet on the other side, it is all about me as well. Because Christ still would have gone to the cross if it was just you or if it was just me. He still would have gone to the cross if we were the only person on this earth who needed salvation. That is the beauty of the cross. It's not about us, but it's about what Christ has done for us. And so when Paul says, let us boast in nothing else but in Him, we realize how insignificant these earthly successes are. We realize how insignificant these successes are because they are going to pass away. And not all of us will even be successful. Some of you know exactly what it means to be unsuccessful in a job and to lose that job. Some of you know what it means to be unsuccessful in marriage and to lose your spouse. Some people know what it means to be unsuccessful in your family and to struggle to get along, to even to have Thanksgiving dinner together. And you know your, those times when you've been unsuccessful. But that's why we keep going back to that cross where we have the true promise of victory, the true promise of success, the true promise of Christ's victory over sin, death, and the devil so that we might spend eternity with Him. Because it's the promise of the cross. That is what we boast in each day. That is what we look forward to, and that is true victory. It is not what our day-to-day -day lives look like, but it is what that last day looks like. And as we do look at our day-to-day -day times where we boast in the Lord, it means that in the lives that we live, that sometimes we do have to humble ourselves. It means that sometimes we don't get our way. It means that sometimes those who we think should be last are going to be first, and when we think we should be first, we're going to be last. But it also reminds us that it is not all about us, but about Christ. And so as we boast in the Lord, as we live out our lives each and every day as Christian people, we should desire that all people do not see us, but see Christ, or see Christ through us. Let us now boast in the Lord. Amen. Please pray with me. Lord Jesus, we give thanks to you for your sacrifice on the cross. We give thanks to you for your defeat of death. We give thanks to you for the promise of true victory that we will have with you in heaven forever. We pray, Lord, that in those times where we become self-centered, thinking that it should be our way, that we would come before you and humble ourselves, confess our sins, and realize that your desire is for us to be unified as your people. Your desire is for us to come before you as one people, to come before the world as one people sharing the gospel. Help us to put aside those differences. Help us to put aside those things which create animosity so that all may know your promise of salvation. This we pray through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen.